Bombarded with images of war. The pictures pile up, and with them some solid assumptions. We assume that there's an epidemic of war, and it's only getting worse. That it's too profitable for some businesses to stop, and too effective for some governments to give up. We assume that war is human nature, and it'll be with us forever. None of these things is true. The world is changing. We are changing. For the last 15 years almost, we've been resolving more conflicts than have started during that period. The number of conflicts has come down, the number of people dying violent deaths has come down quite dramatically, of the order of 80% over the last 15 years. There are a lot of little wars and conflicts going on around the world, that's true, but if you look at the number of people being killed, the casualties, the destruction, it's, it's a, on a much lower scale than anything we've seen for a long, long time. If you compare it with the First World War, the Second World War, the Vietnam War, even Iraq. Iraq is the exception rather than the rule. The kinds of wars that uh, we've gotten into in the past generation, but of which Iraq is the most recent example, uh, tell us that there are also very serious limits to what military power can actually achieve. I don't think that we as human beings have become any, any wiser or any nicer. I mean, it seems that evilness can break out in the Middle East or in Yugoslavia or not so long ago in Europe or many places. We're all capable of that. But at the same time, I think that the interdependence is increasing so much. How do we get around being human? That's the essential argument of peace. At the beginning of the new millennium, is it possible that the human race is taking an evolutionary leap? Are we by sheer necessity outgrowing war? This is the real news, the news you don't get to see on your television every night. It's peace that's breaking out everywhere. I noticed that there were people all over the world in the hot spots and trouble spots of the world who devised brilliant ways of lowering tension. People brave enough not to pick up an AK-47. Nobody knew about them. In 1992, my spiritual teacher is killed by the Christian militia group in Nigeria. A non-violent spiritual teacher who loved everybody around him. How would you dare maim such an old man, such a spiritual guru? How should he be the target of being killed? And that um, the desire for vengeance, the fire of vengeance was burning deep in my heart. I lost my hands in the defense of the church, and it happened in the outskirts where one of my bodyguards was killed. I feel every other person, particularly any Muslim, can die and go to hell. And even preaching to them is like a waste of time to me. And my hate for them knew no bounds. Nigeria struggling to put the legacy of decades of corrupt military government behind it, it's one of the most violent countries in the world. Oil rich, its wealth flows out of the country while its people live on less than a dollar a day. Right in the middle of the unrest is the town of Kaduna, an explosive little microcosm of what we're told is the overwhelming conflict of our times the clash between Islam and the West. 
At the worst of the violence here, 40 people were killed every hour as Muslim and Christian militias vie to wipe each other out. For me to join the militia, it's like being a vendetta, coming back to avenge. So this militia gave me is, uh, the opportunity to vent out the venom of anger that I have over these years, that I have built over these years. I was a fanatic, and I was an extremist. And I got to the level of terrorism, terrorizing those who doesn't follow away. The young men thought they were defending their faiths, but their own spiritual leaders disagreed. I went to the mocks, and the imam was talking about how you can make your enemy your best friend. And I said, no, they have hit us. They support us, our enemy. We have to deal with them. He said, the best way to deal with them is to love them. Pastor Ina Amako said to me, James, you cannot preach Christ with hate. What would Jesus do if you were here? If Jesus will love the Muslims, then I ought to love them. With the prospect of a generation of young men annihilating each other, their leaders forced them to sit down and talk. They were given no choice. Like everyone else in the town, James and Muhammad hated the idea. People feel, no, you can't do that. It's one of the traumatic periods of my life. One take a decision, and you're not sure you are right, and you feel lonely. When you look back and you see no one beside you. We have been trained. We have gone to many places to facilitate reconciliation, yet I was not totally in it because I was afraid, and I was still nursing some pains from time to time. It like the pangs grow up in me, and I have to control it. There were instances that I thought of suffocating him when we share rooms, when we go out into the field. As he, 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 he uses his energy so much in the day, and when he wants to sleep, he sleeps deep. And I felt that could be an opportunity for me to use a pillow and kill him. But then something happened. We have just started the journey. When my mother took ill, he came to visit my mother in hospital. That's got me thinking. I said, these Muslims, though they, are, they look terrible, they do so many bad things. Can they also be concerned about someone else's mother's uh, ailment? So it started breaking my, my resistance. Now they made a radical decision. The most volatile difference between them had always been religion. To make real peace, they would not bury the question of faith. They would go headlong into it together. We said about organizing debate on common issues. What is the position of Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus in Islam? Who is Jesus in Christianity? We identified over 125 areas that when you remove the verses from the Bible and the Quran, you will think that this, these scriptures are as the same scripture. So that through it, people can begin to understand that though they differ in their spirituality, they can be one because they have one common humanity. For four months, we worked with religious leaders. We have been able to bring Christians and Muslim religious leaders to sign a peace pact. Amazingly, they all agree. Nearby, events were taking a different turn. When a Danish newspaper ran cartoons satirizing Islam, all the Muslim world seemed to erupt in riots that left more than 100 dead. But away from the cameras, something entirely different was happening in places like Kaduna. When crisis happened in Meduguri, it did not happen in Kaduna because structures like that were already in place and they had to discuss it. We went out on the media and talked about it and some of our collaborators uh, were out also speaking uh, and calling people to peace. And that's why no blood fall in Kaduna. It only costs sweat instead of blood. A lot of sweat were falling down, discussing an iron issue out, but no blood fall down. This is a model that I feel strongly that the world can use all over. 
the thing is to create space for one another to flourish. That is our aim. <laughs> This is where peace is actually breaking out. In places where people who have experienced war firsthand are forcing change. A quantum leap from our old notions of peace. For decades, we've heard about something called the peace movement. Its message of harmony is too easily portrayed as out of tune with the hard realities of the modern world. The rhetoric of peace is deadened. It's deadened by overuse and over imagery of peace is like, you know, typically you'd have sort of hippies. Too many sort of woolly values get associated with the hard issue of peace. Meet the new generation of peace activists. Protesting the war in Iraq, the soldiers who only months before were fighting there, giving their fellow Americans a taste of what life is like in Iraq. This is standard procedure on the streets of Baghdad, but today they're making these moves on people in America's capital. The U.S. forces in Iraq are no longer seen as peacekeepers, if they ever were. They're seen as occupiers, and it's undermining our ability to make Iraq safer, make the world safer, and make America safer. The soldiers have come home with some big questions. Whatever the rights and wrongs of it, at a practical level, has the kind of war they were sent to fight actually become unwinnable? You simply cannot provide security in an urban environment where there is a well-organized adversary that's rooted in the population that has uh, an arsenal of inexpensive but highly effective modern weapons. Unbelievable amounts of explosives, improvised explosive devices, weapons, machine guns, mm -hmm. surface-to-air missiles, mm -hmm. heavy weapons, mortars, you name it, it's inside this city. Iraqi army could never withstand a column of American tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles rolling across its territory. That was unstoppable. But once we got into the cities, the whole correlation of forces was changed. I thought once we invaded and we had Baghdad, that was pretty much it, you know, and then we were all this, this all these series of things would happen where there wouldn't be fighting, you know, that we'd rebuild stuff and, uh, you know, we'd think, country would start getting better and the economy would improve. And the insurgency really took off and the whole country exploded in violence. If war is forced upon us, we will fight with the full force and might of the United States military and we will prevail. The French couldn't prevail 50 years ago in Algeria. The Russians couldn't prevail in Afghanistan. No occupying power in the modern world can, in fact, prevail. You can't get peace with a gun. It's, it's impossible. You just destroy lives and just terrorize people and hurt them and traumatize them. That's not peaceful. That's just total destruction and it has an effect on people for the rest of their lives if they live through it. It's not just the soldiers on the ground who are working this out. At the height of his criticism of the war in Iraq, James Galbraith was called in by the U.S. Commander General Ricardo Sanchez. There were half a dozen senior generals and perhaps 30 colonels, and I talked to them about many of the things that I've spoken about to you. And I realized that I was a catalyst for a discussion that he wanted to have because he wanted his officers to know that he knew 
how difficult the situation was and how much of a challenge they were going to face. And he wanted them to have a chance to talk this out. Um, and so I came away from that meeting with a lot of respect for the way in which the people who have been put into this situation have been trying to cope with it. And I'm not saying that there aren't things that can't be criticized, many things to criticize, uh, many mistakes. But uh, the military as such is not per se the, the adversary of uh, a more peaceful security system. Many of the world's leaders tell us the greatest threat facing humanity today is terrorism. But is a war on terror making anyone more secure? Should we combat terrorism? Should we have measures to try and protect our citizens against terrorists? Of course we should. That's different from saying we're going to run a war and eliminate all terrorists in the world. Because you can't do that. And one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. Uh, so uh, terrorism will all, always go on. You can't win a war on terror. There's, it's, it's impossible to, to win a war against terrorism. So why would you want a strategy that, that has you locked in eternal war? Okay, it's, it's, it's a dumb concept for a war. I think the war on terror essentially is probably making the world a more dangerous place. If you look at what has happened over the last seven years, we've had about 100,000 people, civilians killed, over 100,000 detained without trial. We have two failed states, both Afghanistan and Iraq. And the Al-Qaeda movement, if anything, is just as active as ever. And what is extraordinary for them is they now have what they see as a, a combat training zone in uh, Iraq against the world's best armed troops, really training a new cohort of paramilitaries for the next two or three decades. So overall, I think the way the war on terror has been fought has been disastrously counterproductive. The global war on terrorism is something to which all our states are uh, committed and our peoples have suffered from. We have suffered from suicide bombings, innocents have been killed by bin Laden's actions in our capital Amman. However, the global war on terror does not contribute to the resolution of uh, issues of conflict through peaceful means because it's turning these regional issues, these ethnic conflicts, into ideological conflicts. What the war on terror does is to exacerbate the cycle of violence. It actually drives the cycle of violence round again. At the top, there's an, there's an atrocity. The result of the atrocity on those affected immediately is shock and terror. The next result is grief at what's happened. And the next result, going round the circle, uh, is anger at what's happened. And if nothing is done, anger turns into bitterness, bitterness turns into the desire for revenge, and then there's retaliation, and then there's another atrocity. And round it goes again. That's, that's the way violence works. A decade ago, the families of the village of Niv Shalom Wahad al Salam set out to build a different life. It's school is the only one in Israel where Arab and Jewish children together learn both cultures in both languages. This is where Rani goes to school. His best friend Yuri is Jewish. I 
אתה לא רואה זה שתיים, כאילו, אתה לא רואה חבורה של יהודים ערבים, אתה רואה חבורה של ערבים, חבורה של יהודים. כאן כולם מסתובבים אחד עם השני, לא שואלים ערבי יהודי. אני המגרש. לא, אני לא מסתכל על יהודי ערבי. כולם, כאילו, חברים, חברים. עדיין לא מדליקים את האורות, קוראים לכל הילדים בנווה שלום, וכולם באים כאן יושבים. יושבים בצד, מביאים כל מה שאתה רוצה להביא. כן, שמתי את זה. Yuri's family decided to move to the village just before he was born. במובן הזה, וחוץ מזה, גם חשבנו על זה שזה יהיה מאוד נעים לגדל את הילדים שלנו במקום שבו יש גדלים איתם ילדים ערבים, ואז הם יגדלו מתוך, בתוך, באופן טבעי, עם תודעה שה... ערבי, הוא, גר, הוא ישראלי, והוא גר במדינה, והוא שווה זכויות, ויהיה להם... הם יגדלו להיות סובלנים, והם יגדלו להבין את המציאות כמו שהיא, מה שאנחנו, כשהיינו ילדים, לא חיינו ככה בישראל, חיינו ב, ב, מתוך התעלמות מהקונפליקט, מתוך התעלמות ב, מהערבים הישראלים, מודעים למציאות. הם לא חיים מתוך הכחשה. חברה שהם חיים בה היא לא מכחישה, לא את העבר, לא, לא את הכיבוש בהווה, לא את ההיסטוריה של הקונפליקט. למשל במלחמה, אז אחרי החופש, אז דיברנו על זה בכיתה, והכל היה בסדר. כל אחד אמר את מה שיש לו להגיד, ואף אחד לא פחד כיסא. זה לא... זה לא... לא נוצר מזה ריב או דברים כאלה. היה בנווה שלום חום. רק החום. Tonight, it's the graduation concert for Bob Mark's sixth graders. The unique experience of this school is over. Like children everywhere in Israel, next year, Yuri will go on to a Jewish school and Rami to a separate Arab school. Certainly the kids who have gone through this experience come out with a very different appreciation, a different understanding of what can be between Jews and Arabs. On the world stage, sometimes it seems that our leaders struggle to do what has come so easily for these Israeli children, see the world differently. The government's judgment on balance is that though the Cold War is over, we cannot be certain in the decades ahead that a major nuclear threat to our strategic interests will not emerge. Fifteen years after the end of the Cold War, Prime Minister Blair promised billions in public money to renew the Trident nuclear program. Ready to develop nuclear weapons, or Iran, which is improving... Now the Trident will target new enemies. That there is a possible connection between some of those states and international terrorism. Well, to uh, think of nuclear weapons against terrorists is like thinking that you would like to shoot mosquitoes with cannons. Uh, it is, me is meaningless. Um, they, are not, they are not a deterrent against uh, terror. They are not a deterrent against terrorists. Uh, they were a deterrent in, during the Cold War, uh, but no longer. We do not uh, expect any conflicts of that size between the nuclear weapon states. Let's say a terrorist has a nuclear weapon um, and uh, they are going to use it in Sydney, how are you going to use a nuclear weapon against that to, as, as a countervailing power in that sense? So it doesn't work in that sort of thing. Nuclear weapons have no utility whatsoever other, other than as a deterrent against another nuclear armed power. Nuclear weapons are useless. Useless. You cannot use them for any military purpose and are Leading military commanders will tell you this. They all say it. They are unusable. 
They're not even potent as a threat anymore. And yet, uh, the British government has just decided to spend what will eventually end up being more than 80 billion pounds of taxpayers' money on renewing and rebuilding the Trident missile system. It is totally useless, even if we did face a, th a threat. The threats we're supposed to be facing, which are terrorism, can you use a nuclear weapon for that? Can you find a terrorist and drop a nuclear weapon on a terrorist? Despite their declining strategic value, governments around the world are spending more and more on nuclear weapons, and more countries are pushing to join the nuclear club. We should also have to call the public's attention to the fact that to another inconvenient truth, namely that we have restarted an arms race. Uh, Kofi Annan said a year or so ago that the world need to be aware that we have, we are sleepwalking into an arms race. And it's not just a nuclear arms race. In the last 15 years, while the number of wars around the world have dropped by half, military budgets have exploded. I think it's an absurdity that the world is spending $1.3 trillion on defense industries. If the standard uses of the military are failing and the most advanced weapons technology has no strategic application, why are we still spending billions? Well, there are those who don't want peace. <laughs> when we were over there, I mean, we really saw the, the truth of it in that here's these contractors making hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, you're asked to be there on principle. You realize that you know, when people are profiting at such a, an extent, you know, it's just totally, uh, totally unacceptable, you know, and, and you really got to look at if there's people benefiting so much from this, what's the real motive? And, uh, I mean, the real motive appeared to be greed and profit to me. War destroys prosperity. I'm not saying that you can't make profit out of war. People do make profits out of war. Um, but the profits that are lost, the profits that are never realized, the opportunities that are never taken up, vastly exceed the profits that are gained. If you took the U.S. military budget and just moved it over to the civilian side, it would not make a lot of difference to the total number of jobs or the total profitability of the economy. Um, what it would do, though, is it would move resources, bring them to bear on the quality of civilian life. Now, we have a decayed infrastructure in this country. You could do an enormous amount to improve it. And this is where you see the cost of the military as you go out and you drive around and you look at the cities and the suburbs in the United States, and you can see they're getting old. They're not being maintained. They are certainly not on the technical frontier of civilian life that you observe in Europe or you observe even in China. Like this? Yeah. Right now we're going around. We are Iraq veterans against the war. The best way to support the troops is to bring them home now. But it's going to take a lot of help, a lot of love, and a lot of loot. <laughs> Amidst the patriotism and passions of going to war, it's often hard to get the issue of costs on the agenda. But for those who go to fight, the costs can be immense and unexpected. The advances in medical technology and how fast we can get someone to a hospital um, into like a surgeon, you know, is, is the time is so little. A lot of people are surviving that in past wars would have died without question. So. There's so many people that are calling back in pieces and maimed horribly. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Tens of thousands of wounded veterans from this war, much higher fraction than in previous wars, uh, who are going to require very, very costly treatments for, 
in many cases, their entire lives, and who, of course, are, as people, deeply hurt. Uh, and the, the failure to take this cost into account is a huge piece of the overall cost of the war for the United States. Let's leave aside the costs on Iraq and the Iraqi people, which are, of course, of a different order of magnitude. But for the United States, the direct cost of the war is almost relatively small compared to the cost that we will be paying year after year for decades that's now built in and cannot be avoided uh, for the treatment of these young people who have been badly injured. But countries that are so preoccupied with war can lose the power to take care of their own people, even in times of emergency. The United States is spending billions rebuilding Iraq, but it has its own disaster zone at home yet to be fixed. Hurricane Katrina turned the people of New Orleans into refugees. A taste of what lies ahead for the planet. And they're out of water as far as I know. This is pretty desperate. Yeah. There's now 6.6 .6 billion people on the planet. Um, and we see that the metabolism of our modern economy is on a collision course with the metabolism of our planet. That's why we're having global warming. That's nature fixing the problem, you know? We've got to fix the problem. If we don't, nature will certainly fix it, but it won't be in a way that will benefit us. The other major threat to peace in the world is global warming and climate change. And we're seeing this now in the most horrific ways. It's the root of the root cause of the conflict in Darfur is the fact that there just isn't enough pasture land for the animals based on the fact that the water has dried up. What we see again and again, if you look back through history, for communities and societies that are stressed by environmental limits some lack of water, changing climate, whatever else, is that they tend to internally disintegrate. Hey, stop. Drop. Hey, stop. Drop. Now, for the first time in human history, these natural forces, far greater than any weapon we can build, may give us no choice but to find our real potential for peace. If humankind is going to survive, we'll have to break the habit of war. War cannot solve a problem on the scale of our environment. War can only make it insoluble. The moment you reach for your weapon, first of all, you lose control of the situation, and secondly, you lose the capacity to cooperate. And that's the one thing we can't afford to do this century. This is a global pollution problem. The pollution that you or I put into the atmosphere today will be over Africa or North America or Europe in a week's time. You know, this is not a problem we can solve individually. It's a problem where we have to actually work together to become planetary engineers. In parts of the world hard hit by climate change, people are already finding new ways to work together, putting aside some of the most brutal conflict on the planet. The young boys between the age of 16 and 24 who were actively involved in the military, the community military way of life, and like you don't graduate to adulthood without like killing a man. The only way that they can show they've killed a man is by chopping off like uh, the, the male organ and you take that back to the village. Kenya has been plagued by a hyper-military culture since independence. 
but its troubles have been tipped into outright strife by what has happened to the country's environment. The farming lands of the north have been devastated by drought and deforestation. There is a government that gives us the reliefs, something like food, relief. But now there is a clash started from these foods and lands. And then there is a dams in these towns. Like armies all over the world, the young men are given no part in the decision to fight, but they're the ones sent out to do the fighting. The violence over precious land and water is so fierce, it's not safe to leave their village. How are you? Fine, how are you? How is your day? Local woman Fatuma decided to do a little uh, thing to make a big change. She invited the boys who were set to fight each other to play each other instead at football. We need to change the face of like how do people view the youths. So are we there just to be used to fight and then just be dumped after that? We are dead and that is it. Or can we change the situation ourselves? <laughs> This football is not for clashes, it's for peace. Fatuma is trying to, to save our people. Very dangerous. Please, 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 please. But Fatuma's league came with a catch. Boys from different tribes would have to play on the same team. When they have the football matches, then we have maybe one boy who is a cabra playing as, as a striker, then another tribe playing as a defender. Then, so if you played along one of the boys who is from a different tribe, then you're no longer enemies. <laughs> Fatuma's football league took off. Young men from warring tribes flocked to play together. But back in the villages, some of the elders were not happy. There was a phone call, and I was called by one of the leaders, and he said, like, if you don't stop what you're doing, then we're going to, like, excommunicate you from the community, and it's, like, we will clear you. And here, clearing you means, like, you'll be dead. It is really frightening, but uh, one thing that has given me the motivation like, to go on, like, for how long will I sit back and say, OK, fine, I will be killed, yes, but if I pull out at this stage, how will life be for my other siblings? How will life be for my mother, for my father, and for everybody else who is in Malsabat? Fatuma kept going, but on the day of the grand finale, her league nearly all came unstuck. The first goal was scored, but the other team, they didn't accept the goal. It led to the, the goalkeeper of that team walking out of the field with two of the players. Then the boys were throwing stones. At one point, he even cocked his gun. At that particular moment, what was going through my mind is what if like, any one of them gets hurt? Like, if one of them gets killed, what would have happened? It has to be the boys who are fighting personally to take charge of their emotions. And whatever issues happen, then it can always be sorted out by talking to each other. All their lives, these boys had watched their elders settle conflicts with violence. And here, over a game of football, they got to decide for themselves how they'd sort things out. And the game went on. The two who were fighting then were seated there right in front of me. 
They didn't have a father, they didn't have a mother, so they were just on their own. So we've had incidences of young boys who are initially being involved actively in the violence, now retreating back and saying no to the elders and they're not taking arms. Yes, yes, yes. Now we are more confident in your area so that you can move freely. When we come from town, we move freely. But in the other side, people are getting stuck. So because of this tournament, people forget everything. Others are lifting their cattle in the farm. <laughs> they are grazing in base. <laughs> they don't care because of this tournament. She makes us very happy. And we want just not this area, northern part. Let us go search and see other areas to make them have a fun, to make them forget about those parts. And now we are happy. We are getting our time. If we could eradicate poverty and, and give people a sense of worth, uh, a great deal of conflict would end. It would not even begin. When you are fighting for survival, when you are poor, when you, when you go hungry to bed, there are more people going hungry, hungry to bed than 10 years ago. Uh, caring for the environment is secondary, and it's for obvious reasons. And that's why all these agendas now come together, unless we have a very ambitious agenda for fighting poverty, uh, for you know, bringing peace and fairness to people, we cannot massively address those survival issues, which are the climate issues. If we were to see a real crash program almost over the next 10 years to try and rectify the huge socioeconomic divide and get a grip on climate change, then there really would be you know, serious hope for the future. And the one thing you can say is that since the war on terror, which is very much the traditional way of doing things, is proving such an abject failure, I think the next five years is the real time when we can actually debate the alternatives and put them into practice. Until recently, this might have seemed like wishful thinking. But a new force, the most pragmatic on the planet, has suddenly grasped that peace is indeed worth paying for. Business. I suspect that business can do a lot uh, in individual countries to, um, to, to avoid war and help avoid war. Um, uh, you know, I mean, business, you know, business largely controls you know, a, lot of, a lot of countries, a lot of the wealth of countries. And, um, and I think they could exert a lot of influence over, over leaders. You ultimately can't have business where you have conflict. So it is, it is, it is in the nature of self-interest to promote uh, the kind of uh, circumstances, the kind of uh, environment where, where you can carry out, pe uh, carry out your business when, when there is peace. It's not a, a, um, an accident that the major uh, channels of trade and the major development successes that we've seen in the last 30, 40 years are in those parts of the world which have been relatively stable and peaceful. Global commerce has always depended on hard facts and figures to guide investment, credit ratings, inflation, and employment rates. Now for the first time, private business has developed a systematic measure of the peacefulness of individual countries, the Global Peace Index. The key point of the Global Peace Index is that peace can and has and will continue to be measured. The second point 
is that peace and prosperity are linked. And the third point is that the Global Peace Index profiles or paints a picture of what peaceful nations look like. The GPI rates the world's most peaceful countries as Iceland and Denmark. The least peaceful are Sudan, Somalia, and Iraq. What is it that leads to peace? Well, we found that there were quite a few drivers, quite a few determinants that led to peace from an internal standpoint. And they tended to be, and this is interesting, not just democracies. Democracy actually didn't correlate all that well with peace. Reasonably well, but not at a high level. But well-functioning democracies did. So it's not enough to be a democracy. You have to actually know what you're doing and get it right. That was a very important part. Also, low corruption correlates with a high level of peace, as does high education and good levels of income. In the future, measures like the GPI will influence our investment flows around the world, a fact no government, even the most belligerent, can ignore. War historically has been the realm of princes, um, but peace has been necessary for the merchants in order for them to prosper. The Global Peace Index offers the merchants of the world a very, very powerful tool to rein in uh, the princely powers, if you want, who want to pursue war, because it's to everyone's detriment uh, if war breaks out. The old cynical idea that war is good for business is giving way to entirely new commercial thinking. In the new world unfolding around us, it's the possibilities of peace profiteering that are capturing smart money. You ask, what does peace mean for me? Uh, peace means for me a world in which we can get on with other things, in which we can begin to focus on the much larger problems and challenges that we face. We would find new outlets for the creativity, uh, and particularly of the technical and scientific engineering and design resources, dealing with the whole reconstruction of civilian economic activity that we'll need to have, and quite rapidly, uh, in order to put the, uh, uh, the economy on a sustainable basis, on a basis that's environmentally sustainable, uh, ought to be getting a lot more attention, a lot more resources uh, than, it, than it is. And that activity could keep the whole country employed fully for a generation because you're going to have to, to restructure the way cities are put together, for example, the way transportation networks are put together, the kinds of activities that people engage on a daily basis. In this unfolding new world, all sorts of actors are rethinking their traditional roles. It's pretty pointless, isn't it, sending a military force somewhere to so-called stabilize a place, thinking that you can change a government or or set up some type of government and just walk out. It just doesn't work that way. 30 years ago when I started off in this business, you know, uh, I started off as an army officer uh, and we trained for war between states. That was our core business. It was about winning wars. That was the motto. Now it's about winning the peace as well as winning the war. In fact, often it's more winning the peace rather than winning the war is a meaningless concept. Increasingly, the work of the military is not in fighting wars, but in keeping peace. If you ask me, the best modern peacekeepers come from people, those sort of, the, on the military side I'm talking about, actually come from war fighters. In other words, you adapt war fighting to peacekeeping. Military certainly have the capability to go in and build schools, build health centres, reconstruct villages. They've got the wherewithal to do that. They are deployable over long distances and they can sustain themselves without anybody else being there. They can set up a full emergency medical ward in 24 hours and be operating doing brain surgery. And producing fresh water, 
as well as having uh, sophisticated computer operators and the webmasters there that they just unload in the first wave of ships. So no NGO, no civil organisation, nobody else has those capabilities. This is Australian warship. I request your course 180. The military has always celebrated the ideas of duty and service. Now they take a new relevance. It's very satisfying for people in the military to think that they're not just about killing people. You know, they're actually about doing a lot of, lot of positive things. In fact, when you look at the, um, the advertising, look at what they're appealing to. They say to young people, you can make a difference. You can help people. Uh, you can use your skills in this way, in a constructive way. If the role of the armed forces is evolving, it's no surprise that the kind of people the militaries are looking to recruit is also changing shape. Great opportunities for women too. You can take up the challenge of short service commission and prove to the world that when it comes to courage and leadership, you're second to none. An army will always be made up of um, uh, young people, increasingly young women. In the conflicts that we're in and in post-conflict environments, there's lots of women on the ground. And we know that if countries are going to be stabilised and if they're going to move out of this conflict, then often it's the women who are going to, to make that happen. I have been here for the past three wars and I'm really discouraged about working and re-establishing my life. Um, I'm sure all Liberians feel that we, we are so tired of the war. We want peace. We want to live a normal life. During the Civil War in Liberia, women paid the highest price. One of the most vicious strategies of the war was rape, carried out on a monstrous scale. Three in four women were sexually assaulted. Even the police had to be disarmed. Some of them, too, took part. Something more profound than order needed to be restored here. The Indian Army arrives in Liberia for one of the world's toughest peacekeeping missions. The soldiers have been specially chosen. As far as our mandate was concerned, we are here to assist uh, Liberian National Police in their day-to-day -day work. I mean, whenever we go out on foot patrols or any sorts of duties, we are there to uh, give them an armed uh, backup because we are the only one who are uh, having weapons with us. Hey, they are not coming. What? They himself are responsible to de get deployed us. We are not responsible. The, the male, you know, they were a bit apprehensive initially, but when we proved our worth, then they have started accepting us. They welcome us, always welcome us. And uh, they feel that, they feel good that uh, we are here. Always they uh, talk that, uh, yes, uh, thank you that if people come here to uh, suffer us, it's very fine and thanking. They're always thanking us. <laughs> The troops are experienced, troops are professionals, they have been into such kind of situations earlier also. The world will be more peaceful if we have more of female police personnel, because females by nature are very kind and gentle, you know. The signs of change in Liberia are dramatic. Its new president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, is the first woman in Africa to be elected leader. A long road lies ahead if Liberia is to put its terrible past behind it. But in a new climate of openness, the country has started public hearings with both the victims and the perpetrators of the violence sitting down together to tell their stories. It's part of a global movement that in the last decades has transformed the way old conflicts are being acknowledged and remembered. The truth and reconciliation process. A process that all over the world has built bridges that never seemed possible.
I was sleeping and uh, my twin sister woke me up and said, uh, a bomb's gone off in Brighton in the, in the Grand Hotel. Which hotel is Dad and Sarah staying? Sarah being my stepmother. And I said, and, in a rather kind of sleepy voice, oh, I, I, I think it is the Grand. In 1984, the IRA bombed the British Conservatives' party conference in Brighton. Five people were killed, including Joe's father, Tory minister Sir Anthony Berry. It was so sudden and so violent and so unexpected and and, and so public and, and yeah, I just felt like I didn't know anymore who I was. And just walking the streets going, Dad's dead, Dad's dead. This is Pat McGee, the man who built and planted the bomb. I was 20 when I joined the, uh, the IRA, and in fact, uh, I, I felt old because uh, most of the ones around me would have been kids of 16, 17, 18. That was more marked even when you got to jail, and I'd have been in a cage of, with 70 guys, and uh, I'd say about more than half would have been less than under 20. He received eight life sentences for the bombing. Back in 85, 86, I did want to understand the community where he came from. I wanted to know what, what their lives were like and, and what would lead someone to join the IRA. So I'd spent a lot of time in, in Northern Ireland at a time when, when to actually hear an English accent was, was risky and dangerous. I was seen so much as the enemy. When passing sentence, the judge at Patrick McGee's trial recommended the IRA bomber should serve at least 35 years. But today, thanks to the early release scheme, part of the Good Friday Agreement, he walked out of the Mays prison after just 14. I was out of jail a few months when I heard that uh, uh, somebody connected with Brayton, uh, a daughter of a victim, wanted to meet me. And uh, I have to say, I, I, the only question I would have asked was, uh, why? The phone rang to say, that he would meet me that evening. I put the phone down and thought, oh no, this is the wrong day. You know, I'm not feeling inspired. I'm, I'm not feeling at all forgiving. I'm just I'm not actually thinking about it. I'm, I just want to finish making the soup for my girls and, and I, don't, I don't want to do it. And then the thought came to me, actually, he's probably more scared than I am. Once I uh, had gathered that she really just wanted to talk to me and understand. I was more than willing, you know. In fact, I felt an obligation, felt an obligation as a Republican to, uh, to meet somebody who wanted to meet me. Pat had arrived wanting to sort of justify his political decision to, um, I suppose, sort of like a kind of military operation of why, why it'd been a target. And, and I was um, prepared for that and, you know, I was OK with that. And I listened to him, and he asked about my father. I talked about him, the kind of man he was. Um, and after about an hour, he, he took off his glasses and he, he rubbed his eyes and, and he said, I don't, know, I don't know what to say anymore. I don't know who I am. And at that moment, it seemed like he took off his sort of political hat and then just sort of opened up. So the memory's coming back. Uh, it'll happen later, I know it will. I'm trying not to at the moment. Um... This is the first time that Pat has returned to the Grand Hotel in Brighton where he planted the bomb. And Joe has come with him. Mm. But even now, all these years later, I haven't really sat down and went through the events of uh, that period in my head. I just haven't done it. Um, it's remarkable that I met Jo, and I killed her father, but that she is still willing to meet me, and we both still recognize that uh, it can be a benefit for us both. We've continued to meet, um, I think, in excess of three dozen times. We hope 
But on, uh, at some level, it might inspire others to take a, a bigger step towards meeting the other, meeting people who they have great difficulty meeting, but being prepared to do it. He said to me, I'm sorry I killed your dad. He said, I'm sorry I killed your dad. To me, violence never, ever can resolve conflict. There's always um, going to be such a huge legacy, and, and it never works. But I, can, but I can understand what leads someone to making that decision. But I think that, it, that even that person um, loses through making that decision, let alone the victims. Like Everyone loses in war. <laughs> Everyone loses some of their humanity. For me, this is about me refinding mine and Pat refinding his. You know, you just look at Northern Ireland. For over 30 years, they, they were at each other's throats and they imagined that they would never be able to settle down and uh, uh, people from both sides sitting down and, and being, being allies. And now you've got Ian Paisley and you, you've got McGuinness laughing with each other and joking with each other and doing things that they imagined they'd never have done. And you say, why are we so stupid for so long? Since the end of the Troubles, life in Northern Ireland has changed. Peace has brought investment, growth, jobs. A war zone is reforming itself into a community. Peace and ordinary people are directly linked. Um, and I think if you look around uh, the world, you, you will see that in so many situations, it was people standing up for peace that actually made a difference. And we are living in a moment that suddenly offers ordinary people new power to make change happen. The most basic human impulse now possible on an undreamt of scale communication. This concert could be anywhere in the world, but this is no ordinary musician playing in no ordinary country. This is Colombia, where almost everyone has lost a friend or relative to violence, including the man at the piano, Cesar Lopez. <laughs> Colombia has suffered almost half a century of civil war between gangs and rival guerrilla armies. More than 17,000 people die in violence every year. This war is not fought with high-tech missiles, just guns and homemade bombs, and like wars everywhere, with lots of young lives. Lastimosamente, sí me tocó ayudar mucha gente con el tiempo de la con trabajar de sicario en los grupos armados, sí. Y bueno, cuando una vez saliendo de una discoteca me cogieron unos cuatro manes, comenzaron a dispararnos, pam, 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 a dispararnos. Entonces a mí me pegaron ocho tiros, me pegaron, perdón, siete tiros me pegaron. A una pelada que estaba al lado mío que tiene 15 años y ahorita cumple 16 años, le pegaron un solo tiro en la columna y quedó inválida. Las pandillas llevaban a las peleas callejeras, donde siempre había heridos, sucedían muchas cosas y en las cuales siempre me vi involucrado. Y este fue como mi estilo de vida. In 2003, a bomb destroyed one of Bogota's top nightclubs. Cesar Lopez was there. Y mató mucha, mucha, mucha gente. Nosotros llegamos al lugar y cuando estábamos allí, me llamó la atención de, de un soldado que, que no permitía nuestro acceso al lugar. Y yo venía con mi guitarra, él estaba con su fusil y y aparece la primera, la primera imagen de lo que podía ser la escopetarra.
it's a fantastic literal way of turning a sword into a plowshare. I mean, it's you know, it's very clever. It's it's obvious but clever because it looks great. It's is you know, here's an AK forty seven that kills people. Now it's a guitar that entertains people. That's wild. Massacres. This is how one of Colombia's most famous musicians joined the phenomenon sweeping his country. Ordinary Colombians sick of war are risking their lives to speak out and say no more. In a country overrun with guns, the Escopatara has communicated a powerful message. Today, 30,000 guns are being melted down. And the metal will be used to make chairs for schools. Siempre a los niños o a los jóvenes que si el arma pudo cambiar, ¿por qué la persona no? Me pegaron siete tiros, me pegaron. Uno acá atrás, que me dañó toda la clavícula. Uno acá al lado de la columna. En esta mano, gracias a Dios, tampoco me la dañó. These days, some of Cesar Lopez's most important public performances are not at the concert piano, but out on the streets playing the Escopatara alongside former fighters telling their stories. Tiene, tiene, está formado por cuatro muchachos. Uno que proviene de la que era combatiente de la guerrilla, otro que era combatiente de las autodefensas, otro que era eh, de una pandilla y otro muchacho que estuvo en prisión. Más del 80% de los que hoy se hospedan en las cárceles son jóvenes. En conclusión, más del 80% de nuestro presente y futuro está tras las rejas, tras las rejas. Sin compasión. Pongamos a pensar que a mi abuela, mi tía que viene en Medellín, yo no puedo volver a Medellín por seguridad, porque si yo vuelvo, pues tú me puedes matar. El hip hop, dar como una base fundamental, como una herramienta para la gente que viene, en el, que viene de atrás, para que capten el mensaje, entienda. Estaría delinquiendo porque no estaría en el grupo. O Siete Pun hubiese vuelto a delinquir porque no está Siete Pun es John William. Eh, ¿Qué significa la, la, la paz para mí? Uf, eso es mucho. No, es que la paz significa muchas cosas. La paz significa muchas cosas y, y hay muchas maneras de conseguirla, sino que, ¿cierto? Eh, y la paz yo creo que se puede conseguir, no, dejando las armas y peleando contra ellas, peleando contra ellas por medio de la cultura, o al menos por los medios lo que hago, lo que hago yo. La escopetarra es la, el sonido del arrepentimiento del asesino. Vamos a abrazarnos. Es la petición de ser aceptado nuevamente en la vida, en la, en la sociedad. Y es el, la semilla de un, de un nuevo país. They're working to change their own country, but this is not just a story for Colombia. Cesar Lopez and his band have taken their music and their message online and out to the world. Billions can hear and see for themselves what the Colombians have to say and talk to these men directly, ask questions, add their own voice. In the 21st century, we will see more and more people networking, mobilizing, talking across territories, thanks to internet and other means, coming together to build a culture of peace. 
increasingly the great problems of the world can only be dealt with by cooperation and that's a function of communication. While governments lag in their thinking and commit millions of dollars and lives to war, while the mass media continues to roll out an outdated story of conflict, ordinary people all over the world are now able to tell each other directly what's really happening. In Burma, people living under one of the world's toughest military dictatorships watch television promoting freedom and democracy. It's broadcast from Norway. The children of Neve Shalom School can talk to Arab and Jewish kids all over the world. I didn't see anything that we were doing that benefited the American people. In Iraq, soldiers film their own experiences of the conflict. They bypass the television networks and send their images out directly all over the world. People like Bob Geldof are pioneering Peace TV, free on the web, connecting stories of peace everywhere. With web TV, basically you can talk to anyone who's online and increasingly millions and millions and millions are online and it'll soon be available on practically every means of communication. That's the first thing, we get to talk to everyone. Secondly, they get to talk back to each other and that's critical in peace. With globalisation as it is, with the interdependence of nations as it now is, everybody's peace really is bound up with um, the situation elsewhere. We can no longer talk about, as Chamberlain did in the 1930s, uh, faraway countries, conflict between people in faraway countries of whom we know nothing. I used to think before, very conveniently, that peace was something someone else did, as is war. War is something someone else did, and it has no impact on me. And I think with what's happened to me, um, my views have changed. Everything just went black. And it's like seeing little twinkly Christmas lights almost. And I thought, God, I'm having a heart attack. And I thought that actually I was dead. And I thought, this is it. This is my end. Jill Hicks was the last person to be pulled alive from the London Tube bombings. She was not expected to survive. She suffered burns, massive bleeding, and three heart attacks. Her lower legs were amputated. In the aftermath of the bombings, while much of London reeled with anger, Jill emerged as a very different voice. I listened to the, the suicide video very carefully of um, the supposed coordinator of the July 7 attacks. And I think what really struck me was him saying that, you know, he's a soldier and we're at war. And, and I did feel, um, I wish someone had told me that we're at war and that I should be prepared for that. And I was going into combat because I just thought I was on my way to work. Um, and it's really quite, that's really sort of hit home to me. And that made me think a lot about local problems that have a global impact and um, how actually this, the world is a small place and um, conflict does reach everyone. No one is untouched by conflict and Neither should we be. I think it's great to have an awareness and a connection to, um, to stop thinking that it's happening somewhere over there. Jill Hicks has joined the new generation of peace activists, telling her story, challenging people to see the world differently and to see that they can change it. When I woke up in hospital and realized and felt overwhelmed by euphoria of being alive and thinking and knowing how how close I was to not being here. I've woken up and thought, okay, I need to do something. I need to count. I need to make sure I'm making a difference and I count. And that means given what's happened to me, I need to do something to make a difference to stop this. And that was it. It's very, very clear. Life is very clear. Most of our people, the African people, um, 
believed in in something that is very difficult to put into English. Uh, there is something called Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. Uh, it's 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 an attitude. It's a it's a it's a, it's a belief that um, I am because you are, and we say. Uh, a person is a person through other persons that um, I, I cannot be human in isolation. I wouldn't know how to be a human being uh, if I didn't learn how to be human from other human beings. I wouldn't know how to speak. I wouldn't know how to think. I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know how to be human. And so uh, our sense of uh, being human is that uh, my humanity is, is bound up in yours. It's a message at the core of all religions and of the oldest hopes for human progress. But it's not just a dream anymore. It's happening. I've lived with that fear for long. And I thought at one point that I need to do something myself personally, and I took the initiative. Y así yo estuve en la guerra, pero hoy ya como ya no soy el instrumento de guerra, sino el instrumento de paz. Many of us have never known war, but we can be part of the outbreak of peace. If you're lucky enough to live in a democracy, you can vote for leaders who grasp these changes and are brave enough to lead them. How I wish the world today, though our political leaders. We embrace the rebels, those perceived extremists, those perceived terrorists. Hug them, sit them down, and win them over, and let them re repent for the evil they've done. And accepting the Muslim as he is, that I cannot change him. And it is time not to just preach Christ. It is time to leave Christ. What can I do, and what can we all do? How can we all own a piece of peace? Um, and I know that what I can achieve, I might not be able to personally achieve global peace on my own, but what I can achieve is peace within my home. And so I start to look at that and think, well, that's quite interesting, because if my neighbour could feel the same way, then singularly, we've, we've achieved peace in our own little domain. And if that then starts to accumulate, then that becomes our area that's a more peaceful area. Then it starts to sort of ripple out from that and that becomes a more peaceful town, a more peaceful city. And gosh, can you imagine maybe the ripple effect of that, a more peaceful country? Because, you know, it comes down to, the, to, to my own patch and what I can do to affect my own, my own life and my own domain. I think that's really powerful because we can achieve that, you know, and that doesn't mean I have to go off and, and be in, on the front line. No conozco, no conozco bien de otras culturas, me gustaría hacerlo. Moverme, en, en, moverme por medio de otras culturas y compartir mi cultura con otras personas y, y otras personas que me compartan la cultura de ellos. Don't assume that what you see on the news is the only news of the world. Change the channel, read a different newspaper, get online, get out on your own streets. Hear what the world is really telling you. How can you possibly solve a conflict if you're not prepared to talk to the people you're in conflict with? I mean, it has to be a starting point. Because I could have been him and he could have been me. My name is uh, Steve Martello. Tell your own story. Change. Pero creo que como semilla va funcionando bien. Voy entendiendo de qué se trata esto de, de hacer la paz con uno mismo. De que la paz no viene de afuera, no, no, la, no la trae alguien como un regalo, sino que uno mismo hace la paz hacia afuera. It's like what more needs to happen, you know? Do you, have you heard? Have you been paying attention to what's going on, you know? We're, wake up, you know? Let's wake up. No, 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 no,
Podemos entrar. Podemos entrar. Podemos entrar. Todo bien. Colors that you fly Love just one nation In the whole world we divide You say you're sorry There is no other choice God bless the people now Cannot raise their voice. We can chase down all our enemies, bring them to their knees. We can bomb the world to pieces, but we can't bomb it into peace. Whoa. Down. 